by nature also. Um, but uh, Africa is, I think, where Pan-Africanism uh, drives its uh, uh, framework. And this is Gay B. Du Bois and Marcus Gavi and those leaders at the turn of the century. And um, I think the legacy of Africanism and Renaissance is of uh, colonialism, at least in, in the political sense, and also so goes on to the end of Africa. So when uh, Mbeki and Mandela and Tutu and the others uh, brought in the idea of a new renaissance on, I think, that phase in this. There is some logic that's simply uh, superfluous in terms of the arguments that are made against why we should promote African languages. Uh, but there's also history and politics of power, uh, and then uh, very little investment that being done in this. Um, Gracien talked about standardization, and other people are calling it translanguaging, where uh, you find language structures and they share uh, words and uh, especially Bantu languages, many of them share things. So it's not too hard dies up new forms of languages. It's been done before. But Lekete uh, Makarela, who is a South African linguist at the University of uh, Vets, argues that we bring in a linguistic boxes, borders of languages, and so they don't accept when, uh, for example, giving us an example of Belede, you take uh, a word from another language and then you indigenize it. There are people who say, ah, but that's not an African language. That's policing the languages, but languages need to grow because they're not static, and so we need to loosen our attitudes around that. Um, in education, this is a big issue. Um, in Malawi, in 2013, we had a new education act, and it made English compulsory from standard one, from first grade. And this is the case across many countries. So the languages are not being used in classes, especially they're being used in the early grades, one, three, four. After that, it's so English. So very little in terms of producing new knowledges in language. Uh, 
Um, so my argument here is that see language as cross-cutting. It must be at the center of everything we're doing, even if it's not mentioned in the policies that and that they flowed. Um, there is uh, an implementation framework for how Agenda 2063 should at the national level and regional level until there are steps that have been suggested. So at least it has to be in national commission, uh, national, national planning commissions. Uh, they need to understand this role that language must be at the center of that. Uh, we, uh, legislation needs to be part of this plan that there is an agenda and they must uh, make it legislation. Uh, so it has to become a blueprint for social, economic, political development uh, for the next 50 years. So the work that lies ahead of us is my last slide, please. Thank you very much. So, um, in African languages at the heart of Agenda 63, learning from the historical precedents, engaging the new research in standardization, rethinking language of instruction in um, schools, seeing languages cutting across, as well as putting it into the national implementation frameworks. And that, in my view, is the challenge of our history. Thank you. And he'll be speaking about linguistic hegemony and periphery languages in the Nobel Prize uh, for Literature. Welcome. You have 15 minutes. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to my presentation. As you've been told, eh, it is mediation between linguistic hegemony and periphery languages in the Nobel Prize for Literature. This presentation is organized in four areas. I have a preamble, which is kind of a kind of introduction. Number two, there is the question of uh, the Nobel Prize for Literature and Hegemony. Three, how writers, especially in the periphery, have mediated or contested. And finally, my conclusion. So not uh, very clear, but I would like to say that uh, there are different types of art in the world. For example, we have uh, poetry, we have artistic design, mosaic, tapestry, and literature. And each type of art has its constituencies or components. When it culture, we can simply say uh, it is an art that is an institution of society which shows human creativity whose chief is language. Maybe I need to explain a bit regarding the institution of society. You find that literature is composed by people. Humans are again people in a particular society. And then the content of this art is simply people. Then the paper is based on the theory as espoused by Ngugi Mathiongo, that is 1987, Welek and Warren, 2006, Ila, 2008, and the rest. And it uses the terminology hegemony in view of Graham's postulation. It is not simply domination, but domination in a subtle manner, whereby you are not coerced eh, to accept something, but uh, you are tricked because, uh, to accept it using a very subtle manner. Okay, I would like to move on. Theoretical background, eh, continue seven.
thousand languages eh, in the world, eh, according to IAGA 2010. And it follows that, uh, or this presupposes that there is literature that is written in these 7,000 languages. But what we see is that the languages of the world are not if they are in an hierarchy. And therefore, it is also crucial to study literature that is produced in different parts of the world is not a eh, egalitarianism. Uh, and we find that there are different literary awards that have been started eh, to recognize those who excel in the field. And among these, we have Mad Booker, Puliza, in Kiswahili, Tuze Bunifu, Norma, Babishai, Niwe, and so forth. Eh? The most prestigious award in the literary domain remains the Nobel, the Nobel Prize for Literature. And it is awarded annually by the Swedish Academic Academy, sorry, in line with the will of the late Swedish philanthropist, Alfred Nobel, who invented dynamite. And Rolla Stone, 2016, states that normally issued to the writers who come up with the most outstanding pieces in an ideal direction. What we know, when you receive this award, eh, you are legitimized eh, as a person who has written high quality work as opposed to the others. So a kind of canon is created where you are treated as a paragon of the virtue. And let's not forget, goes for those who win it, and then it is also covered widely by the international media, and let's not forget, part of uh, works that have won become set books in different institutions of learning. Okay, uh, taking cue on the standardization of languages, one can deduce that there is linguistic hegemony that is nurtured and by price for literature. Uh, and this is because of literary works that win the prize. Uh, you find that uh, uh, normally, or normally goes with the hegemonic uh, languages shortly. In this respect, eh, we find that language can be in vertical or horizontal. Horizontal implying that it is including everybody, but vertical whereby it is alienating some and then uh, propagating for the cause of a few. Thus, we find that there are pre uh, preponderant languages and while others are minor. So if we think of our situation, because I want to get to a point whereby I will show the way the prize has been won in, the, in several years back, eh? we find that uh, European languages such as English, German, Swedish, and French eh? appear hegemonic, and those who write in these languages are likely to win the award, unlike others who write, for example, in Kiswahili, Wolofun, and so forth. <clears throat> I'm producing evidence shortly uh, to show Sorry, yeah, back. Okay, I'm producing evidence to show that uh, in the last uh, uh, Nobel Prize for Literature mainly came from maybe 50 decades, Germany, the United States, 
their Sweden, if I'm not, all those people there, and now one wonders eh, what happens to what we view as the less preponderant languages or the minor languages. Okay, according to the World Atlas 2017, the top 10 countries in the world with most of the Nobel Prizes for Literature as, as follows, and these are the statistics that I've already mentioned. And in Africa, you can find that uh, so far we've won three times, Wale Shoyinka, 1986, Nagui Mahafuz, 1988, and Nadine Godima, 1991. So how does this eh, compare with the rest? So geographical regions aside, it is apparent that their word has mainly been word by writers who write eh, in hegemonic languages. And these are the languages that have been foisted around as being very important languages as opposed to marginal languages. And this may not be a problem for sure. Nonetheless, eh, let's not forget eh, that when we establish a canon, we are likely to convince, especially the ruling classes or others in the world where hegemonic use, uh, languages are used, eh, we are likely to portray to some people that this is the standard. Yet, this should not be the case. So, what do we also find eh, regarding writers who wrote in other languages eh, or from other regions eh, and still won the Nobel Prize for Literature? First of all, most of them wrote in some of the dominant languages. Number two, some had these languages eh, or their works translated in the hegemonic eh, languages. And of course, we also know that it is the Swedish committee that awards the Nobel Prize for Literature. And we have, uh, I need to get the name. Uh, we, what we know is that we are told that uh, if you are to win, you can write in your mother tongue, but the work is translated, or you can write in a minor language, but there are scholars who still advise the Swedish committee on the quality of your work. But when it comes to translation, we know there can be misrepresentations and it has happened to the work of someone, Rushide, who wrote the satanic verses and it was later, or he later complained eh, that the translation misrepresented his source language or the way he had done it. And then let's also not forget eh, that when it comes to awarding the Nobel Prize for Literature, there is a lot eh, of, there are a lot of ideological issues that come into play. And there is evidence, for example, from Turkey's novelist, Ohan Pamuk, who won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 2006. China's Moyan's 2012 Nobel Prize for Literature. And Bob Dylan, one in 2016. So, yeah, to move uh, faster, yeah, that is where I've talked about the question of uh, uh, Salmon Rashi, Rushide. So, what, what has happened eh, now that this, this is the, the hegemonic uh, languages, which uh, normally win the literary prize? What happens with the people who are likely to miss out, or how do they mediate eh, with this question of linguistic hegemony? And first of all, is through appropriation. This is a situation whereby writers in the periphery use the language of the setter, but in their own way, instead of following the rules of the hegemonic language, you customize to your situation. And of course, this has been supported by the likes of Ashcroft et al. 1994. And then in Africa, we are aware that Gabriel Okara 
wrote his novel, The Voice, eh, using this appropriation. I, I don't want to dwell so much on this appropriation. Then, oh, okay. then there is abrogation. Abrogation is a situation whereby you decide to refuse or to drop the language of uh, domination or the language of the center and use your own language. And an example is Ngogi Wadhyongo of Kenya who made a shift from writing in English and today he writes in Gikuyu. And those who are interested will always eh, get his translation. And finally, yeah, there is a lot on abrogation. And finally, there is the question of evolution that from the hegemonic language, you can still evolve or initiate a type of language. And this has happened in Kenya, whereby from English and the, lang uh, and the African languages, there is, for example, an adult that we call Sheng. Sheng, that is Swahili English, implying that the morpho syntactic structure of this language is Bantu or close to Swahili, but it uses vocabulary from both. It is the same question with, with English. But fine. Though, of course, if you, we continue using or mediating with this language, eh, chances of winning the Nobel Prize for Literature for those of us writing in the less preponderant languages may not be forthcoming in the near future. Nonetheless, eh, it is important and imperative to continue uh, mediating and contesting this language, eh, the dominant. Three, uh, three, yeah, because I'm uh, clearing, is that there is a prognosis that the Nobel Literary Prize could get displaced or even parochialized eh, if the Swedish committee fails to reflect on ways to consider dominant or hegemonic languages. And of course, we've said that there are several literary prizes and it would be crucial. It would be crucial to initiate more so that there is a balance and we stop eh, idolizing the Nobel Literary Prize. Many thanks for your audience. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Our next speaker uh, is Abel Jassi Amado, who will address us on the question of international politics and language in Saharan Africa. Muito boa tarde. Gostaria, antes de, de cumprimentar os meus colegas uh, que falam língua portuguesa, uh, e também para, para deixar um pouco de gosto de exclusão aos outros. Uh, good afternoon all. Uh, what I did, I start my presentation in Portuguese uh, because I need to, uh, uh, to make it public a criticism to Codes Ria. Though, um, you know, uh, it emphasizes linguistic inclusion, but uh, it turns out that uh, Portuguese is one of the languages that, you know, even though it's supposed to be one of the working languages, um, um, Codes Ria does not allow, at least for this meeting, this is my first time in, in, in this uh, such event, to be used as a working language. So I want to make it public. Um, what I will try to accomplish today is to share with you some of my thoughts regarding international politics of uh, Portuguese language in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I must add that I'm not a linguist like my colleague. Um, what I do in my own work, I'm trained as a political scientist. I use sociolinguistic tools um, and I weave it with a political 
um, analysis in political methodology in order to understand power relations because, you know, um, like many other authors, for instance, uh, uh, Pierre Bourdieu, uh, language is essentially a medium and a site of power relations and social conflict, okay? So my goal today is to discuss a little bit about what I call the, the linguistic crisis of AO90, and I'll explain about it in a moment in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, the AO90, which we are going to see a lot, uh, stands for Ordo Orthographico de 1990, or the 1990 Orthographic Reform uh, um, um, in Portuguese language. <clears throat> in order to contextualize my talk, I will briefly uh, talk about um, no, the history of the Portuguese language in Sub-Saharan Africa. I will um, give you some ideas regarding what I call the geopolitics of the Portuguese language, and in here my uh, work tend to to uh, uh, pick back on, on the notions developed by um, Kashru and others. And late in the last section, of my presentation, we're going to focus on the international politics of the AO90 per se. Okay, so very briefly, and I want us to, to, to have enough time to discuss the corpus of my presentation. So I want to um, discuss the five main epochs of Portuguese, pres Portuguese language presence in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, namely, you know, the entry, what I call the entry in 15th and 16th century, the development of the colonial state, late 19th century uh, um, and throughout the first three quarters of 20th century, the anti-colonial nationalism, which in a way had a dialogue, however subtle, with the, the language question. And, and, and then I will look at the early post-colonial and uh, the current geopolitical uh, situation of the Portuguese language. So, um, I want to emphasize that, you know, uh, and, and I need not to lecture you on the history of Portuguese maritime expansion, but, you know, the entry of the Portuguese language obviously can be understood in the context of the Portuguese uh, sailors going to different parts of the world, starting first in sub-Saharan, um, in the African continent. Um, what is interesting to note is when Portuguese reached in many uh, parts of the continent, at least in 1400s and 1500s, the relationship that were established between themselves and, and African states and African groups, mainly those organized, was essentially on, on a basis of equality. Um, the Portuguese, at first at least, did not have enough resources, material resources, to conquer those states. Um, what um, they use was basically soft power. And there is a number of scholars who, uh, who write on, on this um, historical uh, period. For instance, John Thornton of Boston University. And he discussed, for instance, the diplomatic relationship that existed between the Portuguese themselves and the Kingdom of the Congo. And at one point, the, the Kingdom of Congo even sent uh, um, ambassador to Lisbon and to the Vatican. However, um, you know, a part of the Portuguese policy was to conquer the hearts of mind of the of that kingdom, mainly uh, through religion and, and language. I, I have one example in my slides. For instance, eventually, the kings of Congo, of the Congo, um, eventually uh, were baptized, became Christians themselves, and they named uh, um, into a Portuguese name. <clears throat> you know, um, those of you who are familiar with, uh, with the Portuguese um, colonial history, you'll notice that there is a sort of a gap from 17 to mid 18. Hundreds, exactly because you know the focus of the Portuguese Empire tend to be first in Asia and late in Brazil. But you know, um, it is in the late 19th century that we see the development of modern Portuguese colonial state in sub Saharan Africa. And that is very important because that's when we start to observe the development of strong colonial policies. 
bureaucratization of the colonial state per se. Um, and you know, on the footsteps of the French colonial policy, for instance, the Portuguese did split Africans in Africa in two different categories, namely what was called the assimilados, or what the French used to call the volués, and the, uh, and the indigenous or the natives. To transit from one of this category, this socio-political category, into another language played an important, uh, 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 was very important by language, I mean the Portuguese language. One of the key requirements for an African classified as native to transition its socio-political status into a, a similado was the mastery of the Portuguese language. Not the main, I'm sorry, not the only uh, requirement, but a major one. <clears throat> So essentially what I want to emphasize is this beginning of, of emphasizing uh, uh, the Portuguese language in, in, um, in, in, in African colonies. Okay? In the late uh, period of the colonial history, uh, especially in the aftermath of First or uh, Second World War, a time, 1950s and 1960s, when um, other European uh, powers, mostly French and English, were withdrawing from, from, from Africa, we'll see the opposite uh, phenomenon in Portuguese Africa, or what Jean Penven calls settling against the tide. Many Portuguese uh, people actually were encouraged to migrate to, to different parts of Africa, mostly to Angola and Mozambique. The idea is to turn them into ambassadors of Portuguese culture and Portuguese language per se. There is a ton of colonial literature on how these, um, these um, Portuguese migrating to these colonies could in fact be a sort of a, a weapon at the disposal of the Portuguese state to maintain their colonies uh, um, in, in, in Africa. <clears throat> but uh, we cannot discuss the politics of language in, in Portuguese Africa without making a reference to, to anti-colonial nationalism in, in, in the Palops. When I say Palop, that's Portuguese for African, uh, um, African countries with the Portuguese as official language. <clears throat> so essentially, to understand the rise of anti-colonial nationalism in former Portuguese colonies, we need to uh, bring together two important social political forces, namely the tradition of resistance, which was very common in all of those five former colonies, but also what I call the contagion effect. If you uh, uh, pay attention to the history of anti-colonialism in Angola or in Mozambique, in Guinea-Bissau, in Cabo Verde, and so on and so forth, you will notice that the leaders often engaged with each other, but also engaged, read, communicated with other leaders of African nationalism. Think, for instance, of the several communications that existed between Amilcar Cabral from PIGC in Guinea-Bissau and, and, and Cabo Verde, in Kwame Nkrumah, okay? Even after Kwame Nkrumah was deposed and eventually moved to, to Guinea Conakry, it was common for those two leaders to meet to discuss various um, uh, uh, topics of, of regarding African politics. <clears throat> you know, and I want to share to you um, two interesting perspectives um, on the Portuguese language by anti-colonial um, um, uh, leaders. Uh, Cabral, five minutes already? Okay. Also, oh, um, uh, Cabral emphasized that the Portuguese is the best legacy uh, that Africans got from, from, from the Portuguese people themselves. So what we essentially I'm trying to emphasize in here is the instrumentalist uh, perspective um, uh, that was very common among nationalist um, organizations. But uh, I want to skip a couple of slides because I really want to go to the main corpus of my discussion. Okay. So I, I want to discuss briefly the um, big agreement of 1990. Those of you who are familiar with this um, uh, agreement, 
You know, unlike the case of, of the English language, these days social linguists tend to emphasize what they call words Englishes in plural to, to mean how you find a number of regional differences in, and these regional differences are in fact accepted as, as norms. Um, to my knowledge, and those who are uh, francophone, perhaps you will correct me, it seems to me that there is a clear dominance of the French norm, by French I mean from France, over how uh, the language is written, at least in the, in the written domain. In Portugal, or in Portuguese, I should say, historically, since the beginning of 20th century, we um, find that Portuguese is essentially a, a bicentric um, um, language in the sense that you have two dominant norms that were developed. The continental European norm from Portugal themselves that were also used in the colonies, uh, former colonies, and the Brazilian norms. So um, throughout 20th century, several attempts were made by Portuguese government and Brazilian government to establish a orthographic harmony between those two varieties with independence of the former colonies in Africa, we do find the inclusion of those five states into the negotiation and into the conversation. You know, uh, long story short, in 1990, all the seven partners met in Lisbon, capital of Portugal, and agree upon the, the terms of this orthographic reform. So all the, the, the representatives from the seven governments, okay? And, um, the, the, according to the spirit of this agreement, the new orthographic reform was to be enforced on the first day of 1994, which never happened. Um, two years later, in 1996, those seven states met again in Lisbon and they founded an international organization, the Community of Portuguese Speaking Country, which became a, a, a main um, international body to manage uh, uh, the Portuguese language. So we, under the aegis of, of the CPLP, uh, two additional protocols were signed with the objective to, to move forward with orthographic um, agreement. <clears throat> but no, uh, um, what I want to, to share with you, which is very important to our um, uh, to our understanding of the international uh, politics of the Portuguese language is at this moment there is a split. You have what I call the micro palops, mainly Santume, Cabo Verde, and Guinea-Bissau, who have gone through the process of ratifying the the the, the agreement, while the big palop. Uh, Mozambique and Angola are reluctant to ratify the agreement, even though they sign at first, but no, when it comes to the constitutional procedure into um, accepting that agreement into domestic law, they are not, um, they are reluctant to, to move forward with that. And um, what I want to, just perhaps see two last um, slides to discuss with you, I want to look at the case of Angola, perhaps it gives us some idea for us to understand the uh, politics of the AO90. <clears throat> in Angola, essentially, um, the debate over the, of the um, uh, orthographic agreement has been led by the state itself, by the state itself. One, if you want to capture the, the, the ideology behind this, this conflict, this struggle, is perhaps this phrase that is very common among um, Angolan intelligentsia, ratificar para ratificar, essentially um, the Angolan cultural and political elite argues that the agreement has, the orthographic agreement has, was written in 19 1980s improved in 1990 was incomplete in the sense that it does not capture or does not represent um, Angolaness. It was necessary to ratify it before the ratifying process could be um, carried on. Um, and the last slide I want to share with you and perhaps to conclude at the same time is to present you some of the, the rationales 
that um, um, help us understand the Angolan position vis-a-vis -vis the um, AO-90. First, this movement uh, uh, ratify in order to ratify its part of the cultural and linguistic nationalism. The Angolan position is to emphasize the inclusion of the Bantu languages in the orthographic agreement which is not present. Essentially they're saying that part of Angolan history where you do find Portuguese, the Portuguese has had this historical interconnectedness um, with the Bantu language, therefore the Bantu language needs to be represented into the disagreement. <clears throat> the Angolan government also looks at this document not as simply a linguistic tool, but a document that reflects power relations. Um, language has a mention at the beginning of this presentation. It's not simply a tool of communication. It's a medium in a site where social groups seek to dominate, influence, and control others. Um, so there is a sort of a power game happening in here. So Angola is trying to, to um, emphasize that, does not want to relinquish its position in fear that it would show before its domestic and international audience not being capable enough to resist um, against what is, can be perceived uh, um, in position of two dominant Portuguese-speaking um, countries, Brazil and Portugal. I had other things to say, but um, I see that thank the chair you, is about you. to shut me down. So thank you so much for your attention. J'aimerais commencer par préciser euh, avec et comme mes prédécesseurs que ce qui nous met d'accord, c'est que la langue est un médium. Le médium de la culture et le médium d'une identité. Et les identités, soit elles se discutent, soit elles se discutent. Lorsque Jules César envahi Athènes militairement, il est dans une logique, dans une conquête militaire. Mais la situation va se renverser parce que Athènes est réputée pour être la capitale de l'intelligence. Jules César a besoin de s'approprier les contenus de, du savoir des parchemins qui sont écrits en grec. Et tout de suite, les Romains sont obligés d'apprendre le grec. Pour dire que à la conquête militaire s'est substituée la conquête culturelle. Si Jules César a gagné la guerre militairement, mais l'a perdu culturellement parce qu'il a été obligé de se convertir au grec. Donc c'est dire que la langue en elle-même est une arme. Et l'ayant compris, les métropoles, après les indépendances, qui ont été obligées de partir de l'Afrique, ont cherché un moyen de garder la proximité avec l'Afrique et la langue et la culture étaient les deux seuls moyens. Bien. Pourquoi la tour de Babel L'Afrique est une véritable tour de Babel. Il existe près de 6000 langues sur la terre et plus de la moitié se retrouve en Afrique. Et la question qu'on se pose, c'est pourquoi, pourquoi l'Afrique est capable de passer des accords régionaux économiques, mais pas de trouver des consensus linguistiques dans lesquels passer ces accords. Nous avons dit que la langue est un moyen de facilitation de la mobilité parce qu'elle évite aux groupes d'être limités dans un espace géographique et sociopolitique et leur permet de, de bénéficier des avantages et de l'ouverture à la mondialisation. 
Elle façonne également les identités parce qu'elle permet au locuteur de se reconnaître ou de se connaître et pérennise les liens anthropologiques par le biais de la culture. Enfin, elle la projection matérielle même des cultures parce qu'elle permet de traduire, de traduire les mots de, de pensée. Pour consolider son panafricanisme au sens, n'est-ce pas, de l'unité de l'Afrique dans sa diversité, on constate que l'Afrique hésite encore à adopter les langues de communication, notamment avec l'Union africaine, dont la majeure partie des langues de communication sont des langues exogènes, pour ne pas dire les langues, les langues étrangères. Cette hésitation, il faut le dire, va avec et de manière synchronique l'émergence de la Chine qui s'installe aussi économiquement que linguistiquement et il faudra certainement prévoir, il faudra prévoir une installation sur la durée. Mais quelles sont les conséquences possibles de cette installation économique et linguistique Et c'est pour ça qu'il faut questionner les politiques linguistiques de l'Union africaine. D'aucuns ont souvent pensé que l'hétérogénéité est une chose négative ou alors c'est un frein à l'unité africaine. Les langues, parfois, sont euh, linguistiquement opposées et n'ont rien à voir les unes aux autres. Mais on constate néanmoins qu'il y a des fonds qui peuvent également être justifiés par l'histoire et l'anthropologie. On note également qu'il y a des replis nationalistes et linguistiques et régionalistes. Et je peux citer déjà, euh, et on doit saluer l'initiative de l'Afrique de l'Est, qui a bravement imposé le Swahili comme une langue. Et cela a permis au Swahili d'être euh, dynamique aujourd'hui, au point où il existe une littérature apprécier à sa juste valeur sur le continent. Donc, comment penser le panafricanisme en ce moment-là, au-delà des frontières identitaires Parce que euh, euh, on peut, on pourrait mettre sur le compte de, du combat linguistique, on peut mettre sur le compte du combat linguistique l'hésitation de l'Union africaine à imposer les langues africaines comme langue de travail. Comme hypothèse à ce questionnement, on peut se dire que l'entrée timide du Kiswahili dans le lot des langues de l'Union africaine, en 2004 seulement, ne semble pas avoir résolu, résolu pardon, le problème d'unité continentale. Bien que le, le Kiswahili ait un nombre suffisamment important de locuteurs, c'est une langue qui reste pratiquée dans une seule région de l'Afrique. On ne sait d'ailleurs pas pourquoi elle n'arrive pas à aller au-delà de cette région de l'Afrique. Ensuite, la présence de la Chine et ses méthodes de coopération pourraient faire reculer davantage ces langues nationales. Et on verra, on verra sans doute, avec, dans les prochaines diapositives, le déploiement des instituts Confucius, qui relève d'une stratégie peut-être bien pensée de la Chine, euh, à s'installer euh, linguistiquement. Bien, pour revenir aux langues, aux langues de l'Afrique, on peut constater qu'il y a une homogénéité régionale. Donc, à ce moment, il est difficile, il est véritablement difficile de penser que la diversité puisse être un problème. Il y a des regroupements avec des fonds communs. Ça veut dire qu'il peut y avoir des langues régionales adopté à juste titre. Concernant l'importance de la langue, ou du moins plus ou moins consciente, l'Union africaine a créé une université panafricaine. Et ce qui va nous intéresser dans, dans cette initiative, c'est davantage le programme de traduction et interprétation 
mise sur pied par l'Union africaine. Ce programme, nous le connaissons parce qu'il est logé au Cameroun. Il a été logé dans un premier temps à l'université de Yaoundé 1, avant d'être délocalisé à l'université de Boya et euh, est actuellement sous la responsabilité de l'école supérieure de traducteurs et interprètes de l'université de Boya. Nous avons observé le fonctionnement de, cette universi de, de ce programme, pas particulièrement du, de l'université, mais de ce programme euh, sur le plan de la répartition des langues. Ensuite, l'Union africaine déclare, et là il faut également prêter attention à la langue, que les langues de travail de toutes ces institutions sont, si possible, si possible, les langues africaines, ainsi que l'arabe, l'anglais, le français et le portugais. On ne sait pas ce que c'est que ça veut dire, si possible. Si possible, les langues africaines, lesquelles il y a un vague qui, particulièrement, met à mal les langues, les langues africaines. Alors, nous avons, après avoir observé les échanges économiques des régions en Afrique, nous avons essayé de comprendre pourquoi l'Afrique est capable de rentrer dans des accords régionaux plus ou moins prospères, mais incapables de rentrer dans des accords régionaux linguistiques, qui peuvent permettre, qui peuvent permettre d'homogénéiser, euh, n'est-ce pas, euh, la pensée et la culture sans... Nous sommes intéressés euh, à une théorie économique pour pouvoir expliquer ce euh, euh, de l'Afrique. Notre théorie du jeu, la théorie du jeu, qui voudrait que les acteurs économiques se placent et c'est de leur le moins des opportunités qui s'avèrent positives pour, pour eux. Dans ce positionnement, les acteurs développent des stratégies de ce que celui sert, mais si je peux dire, sert à euh, également déployer comme euh, nous allons appliquer euh, cette théorie-là dans. Sur la base de cette théorie, nous avons essayé de modéliser le jeu et nous avons constaté que les accords économiques occupent une place pondérante avec un fonds, un axe intra-régional et le second qui obéit à une logique interrégionale. Et bien entendu, euh, nous sommes intéressés à, aux cinq régions. Et, et ça, on, garde, on doit garder à l'esprit également, on reste un observateur de ce jeu. Je ne sais pas si c'est suffisamment clair. Un schéma, leur chevauchement en Afrique. Il y en a suffisamment. Ça veut dire que l'Afrique bouge sur le plan, le plan régional. Dans chaque pays, contrôle l'économie. Dans la CDAO, nous avons le Nigeria. Dans l'Afrique du Sud, CAE, on a le Kenya. À l'UMA, on Mais sauf chacune de ces organisations, les langues de travail sont toujours des langues exogènes. Qui a le Swahili. Alors, chacune de ces régions 
une langue qui regroupe un certain nombre très important de locuteurs. L'arabe a près de 150 millions de locuteurs, le Kiswahi 100 millions, le Haoussa 18 à 50 millions, le Lingala 25 millions, les Izizoulou 10 à 8 millions de locuteurs. Ça veut dire que ce ne sont pas les locuteurs, ça veut dire que les échanges peuvent se faire dans ces langues-là. La Chine, ce jeu, se positionne sur 40 territoires africains. Avec sa, son soft power, place de manière magique les... et il y a logique et les actions. On veut à ce moment-là que dans ch chacun des pays qui, dans une souris puissante, a deux ou plusieurs instituts confessus. Là où il y a un nombre de locuteurs d'une langue africaine officielle important, la Chine n'installe comme action pédagogique, des formations de l'apprentissage de la langue qui sont parfois gratuites ou alors qui prennent des formes, des formes de bourse aux étudiants de la langue chinoise, chinoise. Donc, il y a un rapport de force qu'il faut absolument au sens chinois du terme. Donc, il y a une, une installation culturelle qui fait reculer ou alors qui a pour but de faire recruteur des dans ces régions et dans ces pays piliers dans les sous-régions. Culturelle, elle organise des conférences, des spectacles, des expositions, des réalisations, et parfois ces actions trans se traduisent par des cours gratuits dans les écoles primaires. Et ces écoles primaires ne rencontrent souvent pas la langue nationale. C'est à dire que dans 10-15 ans, ces enfants qui sont aujourd'hui au primaire auront une connaissance de la langue et de la culture chinoise, mais pas de leur langue nationale. Alors, l'Institut Confucius a des spécificités, il y a la gratuite cours, et il est possible, il est possible que dans le temps, s'il si n'y a pas une véritable politique linguistique panafricaine, euh, impulsée par l'Union africaine, on aura, l'Afrique aura beaucoup de mal linguistiquement à relever les langues, les langues nationales. Et l'une des propositions, nous avons fait des propositions qui passent par la, les couleurs en passion, l'intellectualisation. Je reviens et j'insiste, littérature, la littérature, parce que elle, elle permet de garder vivante, elle permet d'en de, de, développer la grammaire. Nous l'avons vu en Europe avec euh, les, des, des écrivains. Euh, 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 le, qui ont abouti à le euh, premier livre de grammaire français. Des, et illustration de la langue n'est pas ce rapport au en vain de territoire. D'accord, je vais arrêter. Monsieur le modérateur. Ok, thank you. Thank you so much. Paper on language documentation 
or, or um, documentary linguistics. If each of us from, from our, our own 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 Consensus around orthography. And, and in the African case, also Yoruba, Benin, and the Francophone zone. So, um, a series of overlapping things with all the. Um, the prize is simply. Most writers don't. It's a high standard, a high bar to to aspire. That you mentioned there. political economy of book, book production, production, circulation, publication, publication translation, etc., etc., et which can be included in that sort of economy of, of um, literature. So the question, question um, yeah. yeah. mother tongue language, mother tongue education, which seems to be an emerging thought amongst the leaders.
physics, uh, professors of um, uh, you know, sciences and so on. But it So you want to go, go for that, that kind of language. Thank <laughs> you. 
Merci pour ce message. Merci. Et pour la suite, pour la suite, Consensus et pourtant, c'est nous qui défendons dans une des communications qu'on aille dans le sens de la documentation de toutes les langues pour ne pas perdre certaines cultures. Donc, on va aller développer ces langues. Et pourtant, nous voulons aussi qu'on les intellectualise. Nous sommes de plus en plus vers de l'action. Une fois de développer nos propres langues, mais tout, et tout, nous, nous voulons tout, tout le temps qu'il y ait une langue de communication, ne serait-ce que par région. Il y a un linguiste de manière générale. Je pense que notre veste est. Politique. On, on comprend les choses et on essaie de les appliquer sur le terrain. Nous ne pouvons pas vous le faire. a very short comment with regard to Nabea's presentation and the gentleman from Malawi.
Now, now my, my uh, Nadia talked about English as a periphery and the adulteration of English. I'll be very uncomfortable with that. Because it's not that it has been adulterated. Even if you Euh, la France est bien. 